Hi, I'm Maeve McLennigan. I'm a journalist at the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, and you are in the stream. Hi, I'm Femi OK. And I'm Malika Bilal. What would you do if telling the truth meant defying your government? Today we meet the whistleblower who tried to stop the Iraq war. So share your thoughts on the matter. You can tweet us and leave your comments in our live YouTube chat, and you might be in the stream as well. In the lead up to the 2003 Iraq war, Catherine Gunn uncovered a plot by the United States to spy on the United Nations. Uh, the goal was to uncover information about holdout delegates on the UN Security Council in an attempt to force their support for a war. Gunn's largely overlooked story is the subject of a new film, Official Secrets. Have a look. Intelligence may be being manipulated to take this country to war. This paper needs to stop taking Tony Blair at face value. You had nothing to gain and everything to lose. This could result in a prison sentence. Do you want to risk it all? This war is historically unpopular. It's everywhere. Every country. Biggest demonstration in human history. If we do not go public, we would be conceded that no one can ever tell the people when their government is lying. And joining us to discuss this real-life story in Turkey, Catherine Gunn, the former British intelligence specialist whose act of bravery is the basis for the film. In London, journalist Martin Bright, he's the reporter who published Catherine's leaked memo. And in Los Angeles, California, Gavin Hood, he's a filmmaker and director of Official Secrets. Welcome, everybody. Good to have you here. So much to talk about. So let's get cracking, Malika. Mm -hmm. So many facets to this conversation. So I want to share one from someone who knows what they're talking about. This is Marcel Reed. She's a whistleblower summit organizer. And here's what she told the stream. Whistleblowers report waste fraud and abuse. That's abuse of citizens, abuse of taxpayers' dollars, and abuse of power. Whistleblowers are the people who report it, and very often we feel the full backlash of having reported this abuse. But societies don't function well and can't become more fair and equitable if people like us don't speak out. People like us. So, Catherine, take us back to 2003 when you got that memo. Did you see yourself as a whistleblower? Were you thinking of the ramifications of it? No, not at all. I mean, I, um, I didn't join GCHQ to leak anything. I didn't, you know, I never thought of ever sticking my head above the parapet or anything. But, you know, that memo had really triggered me. It was... Uh, a show of duplicity. It was. It it showed what was going on behind the scenes, at a time when war was imminent. And I just felt, you know, it was so uh, important for the world to know what was really going on that I had to. I had to bring it to the world's attention. And and I wasn't thinking about uh, what would happen to me at all. Martin, The Guardian is the sister paper to The Observer. And because it's quite recent history, I could look up and, and see that memo still online. I'm just going to go through it here and just showing it to you here. What leapt out at you when you first read it? Can you remember what it felt like to see it? The thing about this memo is that um, those of us who've been working in investigative journalism for a number of years are used to receiving documents after the event. People often receive, or not often, but um, uh, when people do receive documents, they tend to be documents about things that have happened. Mm. What was extraordinary about this was that I was receiving, apparently, a document about something that was ongoing. You know, the, the war hadn't happened yet, and we had almost like a, a live leak. This was, this was um, something that was showing us what was going on behind the scenes that seemed to be in total contradiction to what our politicians were telling us. Mm -hmm. And of course, today in 2019, we have the benefit of hindsight. I wanted to share this on Twitter from Abdul Jabber, who says, the war could have been prevented if only good people rallied and the United Nations was up to its task because this war was based on falsehoods. No weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. So, of course, we all know that now. Some people knew that back then. But Gavin, what first attracted you to this story? Did you know Catherine's story? 
No, I was um, I was uh, called by my producer Jed Doherty, who I'd made a film called Eye in the Sky with, and he said, um, "Gavin, have you ever heard of Catherine Gunn?" And you feel like you ought to have, and I hadn't. So he said, just Google her and call me back. And of course, that led to, you know, the three years we've spent making the film. I met with Catherine, um, spent many, many days with her, with Martin. Martin introduced me to other journalists on the story and to a very famous lawyer called Ben Emerson, who is played by Rafe Fiennes in the movie, um, who defended Catherine. But what I loved about Catherine's story and still think is special is that and Catherine, you'll forgive me if I say this, so feel free to jump in. But I think Catherine is um, an ordinary person who's done an extraordinary thing. Cat's not someone you might generally think of as a high-flying political person. She's an ordinary person who went to her job, um, as many of us do, um, in different fields, and something landed on her desk that wasn't right. And that could happen to any of us. Now, we don't have to be a spy for that to happen. As your whistleblower um, leader said, said a, a person said, um, this can happen in a corporation, it can happen in a studio, a law firm, wherever. And the question I think the film raises and what Catherine thrusts in our face, if you like, by her bravery, is what would you do? What would you do if you discovered something wasn't right within the organization for which you work? Would you have the courage to say, this isn't right at the risk of losing your job? And Catherine, of course, risked not only losing her job, but her freedom. So whatever you think politically, there's no question in my mind, but we're looking at a very brave woman. Catherine, let me just show people the moment that Gavin, as a director, recreated when you went into work. And GCHQ, that's the intelligence agency in the UK, they found out that somebody had leaked a memo. Have a look. Someone in this building has betrayed their government and their country. Now, I'm sure it wasn't anyone in this division, but starting today, internal security will be conducting interviews with each and every one of you. If you know anything or suspect anyone, it is your sworn duty to speak up. If you do not, and you are found to have withheld information of any kind, you will be charged with a breach of the Official Secrets Act. Catherine and Martin, the film says it is based on actual events, so we have you two here. You are in the film. This is your story. How did Gavin get this based on actual events? How did he get it right? What did he do? Um, Shall I go first? Well, um, yeah, go I think, okay, <laughs> you go. You go first, Catherine. It's, yeah, it's your story. <laughs> well, I mean, he um, he contacted or Jed contacted us, didn't he? And um, and said, you know, where, when can I meet you? How how do we, you know, get started on this? I'd like to talk to you. And um, so they invited me to London, and I. I went and stayed for a, a few, well, for a week or more, and, I, and we talked for about five days. He came to my Airbnb where I was staying with my family, and, um, and we sat and we talked. Um, yeah, pretty much for five days, I think, wasn't it? And, um, yeah. and he just said, please start from the beginning. And he had this massive leather book, and he just kept writing and writing and writing page after page, <laughs> and I was impressed. <laughs> Martin? Um, it's hard for a journalist to give up all of their information, but you did that with Gavin. How did, how did he get the, extract the truth out of you? <laughs> the, the whole point about this this uh, whole process is that we're, we're talking about the, the sanctity of truth. Uh, what we were trying to do when we were breaking this story was find out what happened and hold those politicians to account. So for me, when this is being made into a Hollywood movie, it was extremely important to stick to the facts. Because when it, when it comes to release, we are inevitably going to be held to account ourselves for the way that we've told this story. So I was, I have to say, hugely relieved when I met Gavin, and he shared my determination to tell the story as it was. And you have to realise that this, this isn't a conventional Hollywood narrative. There isn't a single journalistic hero that runs through this. It's very much a collaborative effort. Uh, and 
also we as journalists as happens uh handed over the job we handed the baton over to the lawyers a, a crucial part of the film as well so all this was extremely important and i was but i owe it to gavin that he was prepared to fight for that version of the narrative because as you can imagine yeah. there were other people pressuring to tell it in a completely different way <laughs> Right. So I didn't mean to jump in, but I just wanted to say thank you to Martin and Catherine because um, as a filmmaker, you know, here they are backing the movie, thank you, thank goodness, because when you go to all this trouble and you're telling a story about uh, people who are still very much alive, as you can clearly see, your great fear is that you will finish the film and they will say, that's not right, and that's the end of your movie. So it was important, quite seriously, to um, get the information from the source, from these folks who were directly involved and continuously run the script by them to make sure that we were accurate. Um, of course it's a film, of course they are played by actors, of course we've compressed time, um, a, a one-year period of time in Catherine's life into a two-hour film. But as Martin said, I mean, the key thing here is to stick by the material facts, um, and we, we, we have done that, and, uh, and I'm very thankful for the dedication and support and information that um, Martin and Catherine and the other journalists and the lawyer Ben Emerson and others gave to us. Mm. And when we talk about sticking to the material facts. It leads people to say things like this. This is on YouTube, someone just writing mm. in. that She is a hero and she deserves a Nobel Prize. And of course, they're talking about you, Catherine. So uh, there are parts in this movie where you're portrayed by Kieran Knightley so vividly and so beautifully where clearly you're having to make a very tough choice but because it's a movie and it's dramatized the viewer doesn't always see how tough that choice was and i'm talking specifically about your family life your 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 husband at the time who was put in a precarious situation talk to us about what was going through your mind when you decided to blow the whistle uh keeping in mind your husband's status his immigration status well, I have to be honest, I didn't actually think of anybody else at the time. Um, I, I had this sort of, I don't know, a blinkered like a horse, you know, a, a blink, blinkers on, um, which kind of prevented me from even thinking about the consequences. I mean, I don't really know how to describe it, except that I was very, very concerned about um, what was going to inevitably happen, it seems, in Iraq. Um, bombing campaigns, people's lives being destroyed, you know, um, a whole, you know, devastation across the country. And and that, that was like the most pressing um, thing in my mind at the time. It was only later when, you know, when I, my position seemed to be untenable that I felt like I had to come forward and confess that I had leaked it. Um, that's when everything started to uh, hit me and I realized that, you know, I was suddenly going to be in a whole lot of trouble. Um, yeah. Catherine, I have to say, we, we had a long discussion about you over our lunch break and we were thinking, but her husband, what about her husband? Why would she throw her husband under the bus? He was an asylum seeker. Didn't she really love him? And we were literally, we went back and forth about why would somebody do that? That is such a huge sacrifice. But you said you didn't even, it didn't even occur to you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it made me such a, such a psycho, but... Oh, um, man. <laughs> I, I well, didn't. I, I, I was just so caught up in the moment. I was so caught up in the fact that war was imminent. And, um, yeah. And I was trying to remain uh, anonymous. Can I, ask, I, mean, there, I, mean, I was trying to remain anonymous. And I didn't, I yes. didn't think that... If, oh, even from your that. husband, still remaining anonymous. Gavin, take over while Catherine fixes no, her I'm camera. Sorry, obviously through. I, I think, <laughs> you know, what's interesting about Catherine's point is we mustn't, we mustn't forget that, uh, as she described to me, at the moment she leaked it, she wasn't planning on confessing. I mean, she was, you were rather hoping that this would, you would leak and that someone would investigate further, I think is how you described it. And we say that in the film. Is that right, Kat? 
and, and that you wouldn't yeah. ever have to say it was you. And it was only when you saw your friends being interrogated so and, and, and other people's yeah. lives can potentially I, being ruined. Can I come in here and just... She felt she had to step in and say so. But I don't want to speak for... for, for, for... Go ahead, Martin, or Catherine, sorry. Martin, go ahead. Can I step in here? I mean, yeah, I mean, I think you have to remember um, it was a terrible... Um, she, she, she really act in a simple way. She simply wanted to get something out. And had we been able to work with her in a more conventional way, had we been able to uh, to work in the way that we like to work with our sources, we would have advised her completely differently. Uh, we would have, for a start, told her to keep her mouth shut. <laughs> uh, but she's such a, an honest person that she, she just felt she couldn't do that. So one thing that the film makes clear, but is, I think, unusual about these kinds of cases, is that um, Catherine wasn't our whistleblower. Catherine, Catherine did not work with us. Uh, it later became, I think, quite important that that wasn't the case. But, you know, at the time, we had no idea who she was. Uh, and and uh, let's just remember that she's not someone who's trained to do this kind of thing. Uh, she was just acting on her conscience. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so glad you, you, you spoke up there, Martin, because so much of this conversation surrounds the role of the media. Um, and earlier you were talking about handing the baton over to the lawyers because there's this multi-pronged process. But some people online accurately are saying it was the media that dropped the baton in the first place. So I want to share a comment from uh, the Reuters national security correspondent, Jonathan Lende, and here's what he told the stream. Whistleblowers play absolutely vital roles in helping to hold governments accountable. They expose corruption, they expose malfeasance, they expose abuse of power, and they become whistleblowers because there is no mechanism within government, at least in their opinion, that allows them to report these abuses. So they come to the media, and in that regard, whistleblowers play absolutely vital roles in helping the media do their job in holding governments accountable. Martin, so many people recognize that now that newspapers, organizations, television stations were dropping the ball when it came to this story. Yeah, they weren't alone. I mean, I, I completely agree that um, large swathes of the media accepted the government narrative on both sides of the Atlantic. And, and shame on them for doing that. Now, that's not the job of journalists. The job of journalists is to dig out stories and report them. Um, and I have to say, it was, it's not the job of journalists to take the side of the anti-war movement either. Our job was to try and find out what was happening and report it. And I'd like to think that had I found evidence that there was um, a, a cache of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, I would have printed that too. That, that's, what, that's what journalists do. Um, but it was not just to journalists that, that, um, that dropped the ball here. Uh, it was parliamentarians. It was the legal system, it was the diplomatic service. Um, a lot of people failed. A lot of people failed in the, in the run-up to the war in, in Iraq, and we're still feeling the consequences now. Mm. Uh, I, I completely appreciate um, what uh, the Reuters correspondent is saying there, um, but I think that what happened is that because we allowed politicians to play fast and loose with the truth during the Iraq war, we've ended up in the situation where we are now, where politicians really don't care whether they're telling the truth or not. And we have that problem again in Britain and in America. Mm -hmm. Let me just play the moment where Martin and Catherine meet. This is just outside of the courtroom and this is where uh, the UK government is taking Catherine to court. So it's a very tense moment. Have a look. You took a, a real risk. No, you took the risk. I think what you did was extraordinary. I think what you exposed was extraordinary. All our institutions failed us. The government, the intelligence services, the press, they failed us categorically. Even my own paper supported the war before that memo. Well, thank you for being here. No, thank you. It's important what you did. It matters. So, Gavin, the second time I watched the film, I could hear the music welling up, and I'm thinking, oh, that's why I was so tearful at that point. So you're manipulating the audience, but with real facts. Where do you feel this film 
fits into our understanding of the lead up to the Iraq war, the Iraq war? Well, I mean, I'm old enough to have lived through that war. And um, it all seemed, you know, we heard all these stories about weapons of mass destruction and uh, being lied to. And Colin Powell has conceded that, you know, his speech at the UN was one of the worst days of his life. And But somehow it all seemed a little above us all, a little big. And this story took me, and I hope our audience will be taken, into a very personal, quite simple situation of an ordinary person, Catherine, who I know isn't offended if I say she's ordinary, um, doing her job, who could be one of us. I've said it before. And, and so it became a lot more accessible. Um, one is sort of compelled to ask what might have happened had one or two or three other people who received this memo, whether at the NSA or at GCHQ in Britain, done what Catherine did. Imagine if just one other person had leaked that memo. Imagine if five had. So when Martin says that our institutions failed us, and, and it was great to hear him say it and then see Matt Smith say what he said, um, <laughs> um, uh, it's rather lovely. Um, you see, I took notes from my <laughs> journalists and put them into the movie. It was very simple. Um, um, but when he says that, he's right. You know, it's the press failed to dig deeper, but so did certain people within the security apparatus failed to resist more. I mean, in fairness, you know, Admiral Boyce, well, to, to his great credit, was demanding legal advice from the Attorney General, Lord Goldsmith, from Tony Blair, before he would risk his soldiers being charged with a war crime. Well, of course, we now know that the advice was consistently right up until, you know, a matter of a week or so before that war, um, that Tony Blair needed a UN resolution in order to legally justify that war. So um, there are people who were speaking up, but um, perhaps not enough. Uh, and so um, it's a difficult thing. I mean, I'm, I'm not suggesting that, you know, everybody should leak every state secret. And I don't believe, Kat, you're suggesting that either. What I admire about Catherine, or I'm interested in about Catherine, is that she has only ever leaked this one memo. She hasn't, even to this day, told me or anyone else, as far as I know, what else she did. Um, uh, and she's she was loyal. She worked for two years quite happily, I assume, Kat. Please jump in. But um, this was a bridge too far. Is that fair to say, Kat? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was a line I was unwilling to step across. I didn't want to collude. I didn't want to um, be part of, you know, um, what subsequently has become one of the biggest tragedies in the, you know, last 20 years or last, you know, longer. It's it's a huge tragedy that has befallen Iraq and the repercussions have, have um, carried on through um, the last 16 years, you know, we still feel the re repercussions to, to this day. Catherine, I, I wanted to ask briefly before we close the show on some of the repercussions for you via this video comment from Tom Muller. Have a listen. So I've interviewed over 200 whistleblowers and perhaps 1,000 whistleblower experts and activists. And one of the most consistent themes I've seen is no matter how heroic the whistleblower is, no matter how much good they do, how many lives they save, they are permanently excluded and blackballed from their chosen work in the future. And that, for me, is an unforgivable uh, indictment of the industries in which they work and of society that can cheer the whistleblower in a theater uh, as a hero, but then go home and forget that in real life, whistleblowers lose their jobs and sometimes their families, their livelihoods forever. Severe repercussions. Would you do it again? Uh, yes, I would. I mean, I don't, I don't want to live knowing that I didn't do my best. And, you know, you don't know till you try. So I tried. <laughs> I just want to show you what Catherine looked back, like back then because it's such an impressive youngster who decided that she was going to take on her government. While I'm here talking about Official Secrets, this is the movie poster. Be sure to check out Official Secrets. It's now playing in the US and Canada and opening later this year in the UK and around the world. Just have time to thank Catherine, Martin, Gavin. Thanks for being with us on the stream. Really appreciate your time. Take care, everybody.